You've likely heard people say, I don't know what happened, she went crazy. I'm here to tell you that that simple little phrase is motivated by thousands and hundreds of years of pathologizing a woman's wildness. In this episode of Key Terms, that's what we're gonna go over is the history of pathologizing women's behavior. Hi, I'm Dr. Maitha Alhassan, and I'm your host for Key Terms, which is part of the Office Hours series. Today, we're gonna look at women in wildness and what I call the feral femme. So when you hear the invoking of not just crazy, but also hysteria, lunacy, and insane, I want you to think about the misogynistic and patriarchal origins of terms that arose from trying to control and contain this wild woman who would not submit to domination. So this is a history of Western psychiatric diagnosis of madness, medicalization of female behavior, and we're gonna begin with hysteria, which means dysfunction of the womb. It is one of the first mental disorders attributed to women. Even during the 18th and 19th century, female hysteria, or they simply just called it hysteria, was one of the most commonly diagnosed disorders, but it has a much longer history than that. Let's begin with the ancient Greeks. Yes, it goes that far back. We're gonna look at Greek mythology and the philosophical tradition, starting with Plato. Plato believed that, quote, the uterus is sad and unfortunate when it does not join with the male and does not give rise to a new birth, end quote. Plato theorized that hysteria was caused by a childless womb that would become distressed and move throughout the body which he deduced resulted in health problems. One of Plato's students and colleagues, you might know Aristotle, has this pretty famous quote. The female is, as it were, a mutilated male and the catamania, which means discharge from the vagina or yoni, like blood, are semen, only not pure, for there is only one thing they have not in them, the principle of the soul, end quote. Greek physician from the fifth century BC, Hippocrates, you remember that guy, who is widely quoted across social media content for advising, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Well, according to Cecilia Tasca, Mariangela Repetti, Mario Giovanni Carta, and Bianca Fada, who are professors of psychology and psychiatry, quote, is the first to use the term hysteria. Indeed, he also believes that the cause of this disease lies in the movement of the uterus, like Plato, and they continue, the idea of a restless and migratory uterus and identifies the cause of this disposition as poisonous stagnous humors, which due to an inadequate sex life has never been expelled, end quote. This is the wandering womb theory. And the theory goes that medical issues would arise when the uterus moved and came into contact with other organs like lungs, liver, or the brain. Marriage, heterosex, and pregnancy were prescribed to get the womb back into the pelvis. And another Greek physician and philosopher, Galen, offered a slight twist to this wandering womb or roving uterus theory. He posited that retention of the female seed in the womb was responsible for, quote, anxiety, insomnia, depression, irritability, fainting, and other symptoms, end quote. This constitutes what is called the Hippocratic Galenic tradition. From early to middle ages in what will become the continent of Europe, women's Diseases are considered primarily the result of, quote, the madness of love, unfulfilled sexual desire, end quote. And in some cases, doctors in the Middle Ages attributed these maladies as part of women's incurable original sin. So the Aristotelian concept of male superiority was then reapplied within a religious Christian framework. As an example, St. Thomas Aquinas from the 13th century in his Summa Theologica declares that Woman is a failed man, and this is a consequence of the original sin. Women are defective creatures, but some old women are evil-minded, and this is where the woman witch as a demonological vision arises. Quote, the fear of witches spreads in the collective imagination of the European population. The ecclesiastical authorities try to impose celibacy and chastity on the clergy. This is from Tosca, Rapetti, Carta, and Fada. So in this era, which is the late European Middle Ages, hysteria turns into a supernatural diagnosis of women making a bond with the devil 
that requires exorcism. As a side note, the Latin femina comes from fe meaning faith and mina meaning minus. So those who have less faith, yeah, that's what they thought of us. So more on the witches. Uh, Silvia Frederici in the Dig interview says, quote, the need to accuse women, to criminalize any form of procreation, the need to criminalize was very important for a capitalist class who was discovering the power of labor the power that came from controlling a large population of worker, dot, 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 makes human labor the essence of wealth. So dot, 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 how many children who are born signifies workers, end quote. And of course, this means that wealth and wealth accumulation is tied to the reproductive labor of the womb. And let's go to the witch hunts in the US, which occurred in the 17th century, the witch hunts in the U.S. were justified in response to outbreaks of hysteria. A demonological reasoning was applied to women who refused repression under Puritanism. In Salem in 1692, you all might be familiar with this story, women were accused of making pacts with the devil leading to possession. 19 women in this instance were hung and 100 were put into detention. African-American studies professor Callie Nicole Gross reveals that most of the women burned at the stake in the colonies and what would become the United States of America were in fact black women. Now in the 18th century, there's something called natural determinism where a woman veered from her natural desires, that of being a mother and a guardian of virtue was an indication of a moral and physiological imbalance which was diagnosed as, yes, hysteria by doctors. Thus, the woman witch trope is reapplied to maintain social order. And the last witch was sentenced to death in Switzerland in 1782. That wasn't that far, y'all. During the so-called Enlightenment age, the demonological and psychiatric approach of hysteria merged to create a scientific view of women's mental illness. In the 18th century, this is finally when hysteria is delinked from the uterus and then connected to the brain. But this doesn't mean that misogynistic understandings of hysteria did not persist. Now we have some more insight from Tasca Repetti, Carta and Fada. Quote, during the Victorian age 1837 to 1901, most women carried a bottle of smelling salts in their handbag. They were inclined to swoon when their emotions were aroused and it was believed that, as postulated by Hippocrates, the wandering room disliked the pungent odor and would return to its place, allowing the woman to recover her consciousness. This is a very important point, as it shows how Hippocrates' theories remained a point of reference for centuries, end quote. In the late 19th century period, we're still squarely in the Victorian age, Canadian psychiatrist Richard Maurice Buck performed invasive surgeries, such as hysterectomies, to cure female patients of mental illnesses. Yep, that happened and I guess continues to happen. And during this time, one of Sigmund Freud's teachers, jean Martin Charcot, scientized hysteria as a woman-only disease in France in 1880. Through psychoanalysis, Freud built on his teacher's theories, stating that hysteria emerged from depriving women of male sexuality, meaning that there was a psychological trauma a woman experienced because she had been castrated of a penis. And the prescription for this again was, as always is, marriage and heterosex. In the work Psychology of Sex, Havelock Ellis, a physician and yes, also a eugenicist, because this was sadly all too common of a political position for reproductive rights advocates in the early 20th century to hold, quote stated, a study estimated that in 1913, 75% of women suffered from female hysteria. Physicians diagnosed hysteria based on a long list of common symptoms, including headache, forgetfulness, irritability, insomnia, cramps, hot flashes, excessive vaginal bleeding, heaviness in the limbs, usage of coarse language, severe cramping, difficulty breathing, desire for clitoral stimulation, hyperpermiscuity, mood swings, nausea, anxiety, drowsiness, loss of appetite, aging, back pain, swollen feet, cancer, organ failure, endometriosis, heart disease, epileptic fits, and what are now known as symptoms of depression, schizophrenia, and other psychological disorders, end quote. Y'all, that's literally everything. Literally anything that a breathing person experiences is diagnosed as a medical disorder. Okay, let's continue. In the mid 20th century, medical reports from London determined that Epidemics of hysteria were prone in populations of segregated women, as in schools and convents. 
Hysteria or hysterical neurosis was actually not officially deleted from the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, known as DSM, until 1980. Yeah, 1980. In the later half of the century, diagnosis of hysteria did decline as incidences of depression radically increased, and in some cases, histrionic personality disorder replaced hysteria diagnosis. Basically, hysteria for centuries in the West pathologized women who were seen as resistant to the dominant hegemonic patriarchal order and were seen as unmanageable, wild, mad women. Lunacy. Okay, lunacy etymologically emerges in the 16th century around 1514, meaning in reference to intermittent periods of insanity, such as were believed to be triggered by the moon cycle. They even called it moon sickness. In later legal use, any unsoundness of mind sufficient to render one incapable of civil transactions or management of one's affairs, weakened figurative sense of active madness or folly. Okay, this is from Etymology Online. In lunacy in the 19th century, women's admission to asylums in the United States of America by Catherine Puba and Ashley Tiannan, they studied the medical records of Mendota Mental Asylum in Madison, Wisconsin during the years of 1860 and 1900. Let me read you some of the reasons these women were admitted. Suppressed menses basically did not have their menstrual cycle, and this woman was 17. Religious matters, religious fantasy, domestic troubles, abortion, overwork and domestic troubles. The people who had suppressed menses were 17 and 46. So basically a teenager who has irregular moon cycles and a 46 year old who's probably either menopausal or premenopausal were admitted to a mental institution. And of course the domestic troubles were most frequently women admitted by their husbands, their partners, because they had a dispute with them. Crazy and insane. So crazy and insane are also etymologically tied to the 16th century. Crazy meaning broken, impaired, full of cracks or flaws and mentally deranged. And insane was defined as mad, unsound mind and mentally damaged. In the Renaissance, through revisiting of these works of antiquity, through a growing secular lens, Western European thinkers constructed a paradigm of man as ruled by reason and women by emotions. And of course here they are only speaking to a construction of human as a Western European person. And in this 16th century Europe, insanity and witches were linked phenomenon in the rising medical industry. A Dutch physician named Johan Weyer, or Weyer, I don't know, intended to prove that witches were mentally ill and thus had to be treated by physicians. He was the private physician of Duke William of Cleves, and the Duke observed that witches manifested many of the same symptoms as his relatives who became insane. In 19th century Western psychiatry, female independence was perceived and diagnosed as madness. And then the prognosis was to institutionalize them to rid them of a refusal to submit to a male spouse. Kate Moore, author of The Women They Could Not Silence, sums up the misogynistic medical axiom of the times. She writes, the received medical wisdom of the age was that assertive, ambitious women were unnatural and therefore sick, end quote. This is the same century wherein biologically based gender roles were starting to concretize. Also, as the rest of the world, the global South is being absorbed into Western empires and economies. And that's a whole nother discussion. Moore continues, quote, women who rejected their submissive dom domestic roles were medically impaired. End quote. Committing women required the evidence of insanity, which was simply approved by the request of their husband. 
that's what sufficed. And reason for admittance, as we saw, included expressing spiritual beliefs counter to the mainstream or questioning hegemonic religious practices. Even grieving too long after the death of a loved one was grounds for committing a woman to a mental institution. Insanity by abortion or insanity by domestic troubles and depression following childbirth, what we would call today postpartum depression. These were tagged as all precursors to insanity. So basically, women were committed for refusing to submit to their husbands. These transgressions, including a 16-year sentence for extreme jealousy, reading books, and for uterine derangement, which basically means menstruating or bleeding, even a hint of annoyance or hatred of their husbands suggested that women were ungovernable and thus textbook examples of female insanity. This is what Kate Moore writes about in her book. So in response to institutionalizing women for hysteria, being crazy, being insane, chloroform and straitjackets were part of the course of remedying uproarious women, meaning basically silencing them. If that didn't work, surgery was the next recommended treatment and it wasn't just hysterectomies, clitorectomies, um, doctors claims a 70% success rate for calming them down. Now that we know there is a millennia of hysteria, lunacy, crazy and insane being used to pathologize women, to commit them, to detain them, to incarcerate them, to institutionalize them, where do we go from here? And in this key terms, this long key terms, <laughs> video, more like a lecture this time. What is the term that we can offer as part of the liberation work? Here, I turn to one of my poems titled Feral Femme. What do I mean by Feral Femme? Feral Femme is speaking truth to domination, speaking truth to a cis hetero patriarchal capitalist order that locates resistance in this effusive, ungovernable wildness that we carry, a wildness that was interpreted by patriarchs as dangerous, or in other words, hysterical, lunatic, insane, and yeah, crazy. As I say in my poem, Feral Femme, embedded in our crazy, inconvenient, moonsick sensibilities is a blueprint for freedom. 